actually replace this paper. You don't necessarily want to be erasing a lot because you might be smearing the underneath ink or also tearing it because it's going to be older, uh, more brittle, is to create stencils. Now, I have examples of stencils and, and people who are from here uh, picked up some stencils and you can create you know, design patterns that would have been very similar to beadwork, geometric designs um, that were common in Lakota, Dakota culture, depending on different tribes, like those of you from Minnesota, if you're up North Minnesota, you're gonna see more floral patterns and things like that. That's gonna associate more with the tribes, North Minnesota. Uh, but just depending on your region, who you are, what tribe, or, or just in general, the kind of feel that you wanna depict, you're gonna to wanna to look at, those common design patterns and then create stencils for those. And then once you create stencils, I definitely recommend, I'll start going into some of the supplies here. These are pretty cheap light tables and they work really good, large surface. Uh, they're kind of dim, but once you get it at the top, you know, third click, it's gonna be enough for you to actually take your, your ledger paper and put over your stencil. I don't know if you guys can see this. I mean, it's a light table up here. You, you know what a light table is, you know. But when you create that stencil, then you can replicate it again and again. So you have a uh, very, very neat organized imagery that would really look similar to beadwork. And you wouldn't be making less mistakes on your actual ledger paper. So I definitely recommend doing that. Um, here's an ex example of a stencil that you can use. And some of the imagery here, it's not just a pretty decorative design. You know, if you don't know um, anything about the culture, I mean, kind of think of like symbolism and some things actually had, you know, a meaning and probably a lot of things too might not be remembered or be remembered by few. So if you ever look at images and you can talk to somebody who's older and, and more wise on all this information, and some of these symbols still are well known today. Like these images here, I'm guessing majority of people know what those are. Those are horse tracks and you'll see them on ledger, ledger art quite a bit. Uh, if you look at images of horses and you look at what was put on the horses, th that wasn't just to decorate. I know a lot of people probably know this, but it wasn't just to decorate. I mean, there's symbolism and it was an indication of you know, the horse, whether it be good vision or something like that, or something that actually occurred and took place. So a lot of purpose and understanding with what those images represented. Um, dragonfly, I think, is something that a lot of people would actually know. And this is a common design, you know, of a teepee that you'd see in beadwork that is also pretty much known for directions, lightning bolt. There's a lot more too, but if anything, it kind of gives you an idea of abstract, non-representative art, but with symbolism. So if, if you don't know what you're looking at, you might just think it's a design, but for those people who actually have a lot of understanding of what those symbols mean, they'll actually know what those depict. So that's important to remember, Feather, you see that quite a bit. Even you'll see that same design being put on ledger art with their images, and it kind of can show you this combination of symbolism with images. So you know, your feathers there and your horse tracks. And then you can see your actual images. And once I've created a stencil, like what I've done here, I'll then start blacking out everything so I can see it better when my sheet of paper is on top of it. Ledger art is gonna be harder to see because you already have writing on it. It's older, thicker paper. It's gonna be colored and diluted. Um, so then I'll start the process of blacking it, then I'll make copies. And if you make copies or you keep a digital version of this, you can change the sizes depending on what kind of paper you're using or what you're actually putting the image on. And then you can replicate it over and over opposed to trying to freehand it or create those senses <laughs> while you're working on your project. For anybody who's ever done work with geometric patterns, you know how challenging that can be, especially to create a uniform look. Uh, and here's another example of one that's that's finished, you know, and that gives you a good idea because then those images you can put on your artwork with your actual uh, pictures. And I have a bunch here that I use for examples of like what stencils look like. Once you create your stencils, you can replicate it. So all your horses are the same sizes, all your people are the same sizes. Uh, another thing that I mentioned already is it's important not to think of like a decoration or just decorating your wall. I mean, a lot of times, especially with contemporary ledger art, um, it is depicting something, it's saying something, it has meaning, that is art, art is culture, 
history um, without those two components or that critical thinking aspect of what's going on, you have a decoration and that's a very different thing. So, um, but you can do something that's more decorative too, just to get yourself into it. But when you look at contemporary art, there's a lot going on, especially Native American art on ledger paper. Ledger art is considered to be a historical form of Native American art, even though somebody who doesn't know anything about ledger art might not know that because you have paper, colored pencils, you have the use of markers. However, all these design principles and patterns originated on Hyde's paintings. And when you had you know, the eradication of the buffalo on the plains and the impact of moving Native Americans onto, onto tribal land and, and all the horrific history that went along with that, all the materials that would have been historically used with different mediums transferred to what was available. Since, you know, reservation, you have documentation paper, uh, you have traders, trappers that brought these kind of ledger document papers to the Western areas with the government and, you know, people settling in the West who are killing out the buffalo on the plains, um, you know, that was no longer accessible like it was to do the same kind of imagery. So it changed with what was happening, you know, in, in the Midwest um, and adapted and survived. It was culture adapting to the circumstances and, and surviving. So you'll see since where it originates from and how long ago all of that happened, this is considered traditional Native American art. Um, I think that's everything for kind of like the history of iconography. There's a lot that you can actually go into and you can actually research and look at historical ledger art and it'll actually show you like different tribes and their ledger art and things like that. But it's, it's common Lakota Dakota culture and also in the Midwest in general, you'll see a lot. I don't know if there's too much ledger art for tribes on the East Coast or not, but it, it's really been something I think that's been adapted by, you know, maybe a lot of tribal people throughout the United States. And it's really something that's revived quite a bit, you know, probably since like the seventies and you see a lot of people making ledger art now um, and it's pretty amazing stuff. So that's majority of the history and iconography. There's a couple images I'll kind of show you just give you an example of, you know, the stylization, you know, for those of you who've never made ledger art, a lot of times you're not going to put a horizon line for, for those of you who are STSU school design students and you think about making a composition, you're not going to have a foreground, a background, and a horizon line. You're going to have images that almost look like they're floating because they're depicting a scene, not through a given lens, but not just a clip, but like an actual scene that's happening. So you're not gonna have those typical components you'd see when you're creating depth on a two-dimensional surface. Um, also to the colorization, if you're gonna be more historical, are gonna be solid colors that are outlined. So there's gonna be less shading. It's gonna give it a more two-dimensional feel versus three-dimensional, and it's gonna be more stylized. So you're gonna have stylization with that. So if you look at this, you know, there's not a lot of detail on the face. Think of like, simply representing something accurately. And you're gonna get kind of an idea of what that's gonna look like. So that's kind of like the stylization that you'll see. Solid color, you have the combination of um, your geometric design patterns, and then it's gonna be embedded over the, those written words that are on there without a horizon line. And that kind of gives you an idea, hopefully, of the stylization. You can look at a lot of examples that are online and you can see kind of like, you know, a very common style that you're gonna see kind of repeated. And then if you have one that you really like, you're gonna frame it. This is a par flush that I made and I framed because it's my favorite one I made. So once you get one that you really like, definitely go about framing it because it just makes it really complete and, and just amazing, I, I think. So, um, so, okay, so hopefully that helps out a little bit with the stylization of everything. I'm gonna go over materials. I like to use like Prisma colors. Um, you know, Prisma colors and colored pencils are gonna be really, really nice. And if you get a big pack like this of at least 72, you're gonna have such a wide variety of colors to choose from. It's gonna make it really vivid and really pop 
really, really nice. And it's gonna make you get, be able to color those areas like opaquely. So it's gonna just be covered. You're not gonna be able to see the paper underneath it. And it gives it a really, really nice look to it. Um, once you go about coloring, and I'm just gonna go over everything, even though some of you might know this or might like, yeah, no doubt, whatever. Um, when you're using your colored pencils, especially these, they have a softer tip on them. So they're gonna break easier and you're not gonna put a little choke hold on it. You want to definitely move it further back, color one direction and color the other direction. And you're gonna reduce the amount of breakage that it has. And you're also gonna be able to make a solid color within that, within that area. Um, and these are really good colored pencils. If you think about actually doing this or, or you like the stylization, um, I definitely recommend a good pack of Prisma colors. Also a really good pack of markers to have because majority of stuff was outlined and it really cleans up everything is to use these kind of um, Prisma colors and they come in all different all different sizes uh, and you can get all different colors too. Typically it would have been black though. And after you do all your coloring, all your fill in work, then I recommend going back over everything, outlining with one of these markers. You just don't want to get it on top of the actual colored pencil because it's going to kill the ends and dry them up where you can't use it. And these are really expensive. So, but they're going to give it a really clean, crisp look and definitely worth investing. And if you take care of them, you can have them for a long time. Um, light table is something I definitely recommend if you're doing ledger art. I definitely recommend first making stencils. Once you created your actual stencil, you're gonna to wanna to cut it out. And it's gonna be even better if you can put it on cardstock so it's lifted up. So if this is something that you think you're gonna do a lot of, start investing in, in making stencils and then you can kind of replicate it over and over and over again. And I'm gonna do one that's gonna be a little bit easier so I can kind of show you how to uh, go about I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, Lewis is wondering what brand for color pencils and pens? Um, if you look at Prisma, I don't know if Jen can type that in or if you can see it. Can you see it, Lewis? Prisma color, okay. That's a really good brand. They're pretty expensive. This here is like an Amazon basic premium color pack. Also Blick is a good art um, supply store where you can find a lot of different brands and you can kind of shop around and get cheaper stuff. If you're local in the area, Hobby Lobby, I know has Prisma stuff and you can use that. Uh, and you're going to get that really good, clean, crisp quality. And you can actually get the pens too. And um, I think that's all Prisma that they have there. If you go online, like Blick.com, it's a big art store chain. And you can find a lot of different brands. You can kind of shop around and get something that's a little bit cheaper priced. But uh, yeah, you want to make sure it's good stuff though. So yeah, I'll go with Prisma or Blick until you kind of know. But but it's definitely worth the investment because once you have it, you have it. And I mean, this pack, I don't even know how long I've had it. I had it forever and I probably will have it forever. I mean, unless you really like one color, you're coloring a huge space, you don't really have to worry about it. And then two, if you have it and you use up one color, you can actually um, order individual ones too and replenish those, but they'll last forever. And I guess um, since we're on supplies, mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I would have is, um, besides the old style paper, what's an, um, what kind of paper do you use just to do your stencils, just to? Yeah, if you use just straight up sheets of paper, I don't know if there's that many office depots or anything like that open, but if you do all your artwork just on a sheet of paper, all your stencils, then you can actually go and print them off somewhere. I would get a copy of them, like take a picture of it so you can upload it digitally and then you can change the sizes of all your stencils. And I would come up with like three different sizes. So you can do things on larger scales or smaller scales. And you're not always stuck with that same exact size, especially like if you look at these boxes, if you, you end up getting a box, you know, they look like par flesh and you create your stencil. And then depending on how big the surface is, you're definitely going to want different sizes so that they fit that space and look accurate. So if you take a photocopy of the stencils that you create, digital, you know, change them up, 
and then send them to like an office depot or bring them in for an office depot, have them print them off on cardstock. That's going to be way better than just a sheet of paper because this is kind of hard to trace. But if you can do it on a cardstock, you know, that's thicker, it's going to be way easier. They're going to last longer on. Uh, it's just going to be way better. Um, that's what I would do. And then another ledger paper, I mean, Office Depot. Um, God, what else? I don't even know if they exist anymore. <laughs> you know, a lot of the office store chains. You oh, know, geez. Much, you know, Bismarck used to have, what was it, Office Depot and uh, uh, Office Space or Home Space oh, or something. Oh, what do you call it? Office Depot, Staples. Yeah, Staples. Yeah. Staples. I think yeah, that's close. Yeah. But, but you, Places like that, if you have something local, I don't know if uh, Brookings does or not, but you know, something like along those lines, just get ledger paper. It's gonna be graph paper like this. You can get it all different colors and all different sizes. So that's what this is. This is ledger paper. It's just a modern version of it. And then same with this one is done on ledger paper, you know, right here too. Um, different sizes. So and you can get the, the color white and green, I think are the most common, maybe like a light blue. Light blue would look really awesome, I think. Um, um, but yellow? All the yeah, yellow. Like canary yellow, yeah, I think it is. Canary yeah. yellow, yeah. And that's gonna look really good. And then if you do that, cause you can't get a hold of any old ledger paper, I would find like, like when I used to teach this at the high school level, but I was still working at McLaughlin, you know, it would be expensive to get old ledger paper. And if kids messed up, you know, then, you'd lose a lot of very expensive paper. So it's best to get them introduced just on, you know, ledger paper that you can get a ton of um, like this. So that works really good. What I'd have them do is I'd find, have them find a quote of, you know, either an old historical quote or even lyrics to a song that they liked, anything that kind of combined, you know, either cultural quotes like Louis Erdrich, like, like what I did on this one or even lyrics or anything like that. I'd have them write that on there first and then I would put the image on top of it. So some of the actual words would be covered up and that's gonna give it a more realistic feel and kind of like this flux narrative that you can create on there. And it looks really awesome. Um, and then if you look at this box right here, this is kind of like a contemporary version of Par Flesh. If, you, if any of you know Par Flesh or, or look it up, you can kind of see these holding containers, it'd be different sizes depending on what they would have been used for, but they have a similar coloration. They're gonna have similar design patterns like this, this one that I've already shown here that would have been laced up, whether it be for envelopes or, or something like that. But once you create all your stencils and you cut them out, then you can replicate them on a surface like this. For those of you who have the kits and have this box, this is an example of what one looks like and you can create it so it does look kind of like par flesh. And then you can use that for like keys and you know whatever, or even gift boxes and they look really amazing and they give it a, a very um, historical accurate feel, I would say. Um, so the boxes- um, Do you remember where you got those? Um, I got those out of Amazon actually. Um, so if you got a kit, um, it's a little small square box and a round box. But um, what I was told long time ago that um, the far, far flesh boxes, excuse me for talking, I have a mask on. Um, um, par flesh boxes were used to, um, when the grandmas or the aunties would go out and pick um, um, the medicine and also during like ceremonies, um, the men folk or the women folk that were a part of ceremonies, they, um, that's where they put the cedar or the chachasha, which is your tobacco or your sage. Um, and then the other was, um, of course, we weren't a type of people that, you know, had lots of stuff to move from place to place. Um, so sometimes they would make like these little small suitcases and that was of, um, stuff that they were gifted or what they, you know, their, um, resources of clothing and so forth, or, um, um, uh, check ball holders, which is our belly button, um, holders that we have, um, 
those moved along in those um, pouches and so far. So there was a lot of things that um, the pouches were made, um, used for. And like he said, you know, each design on either pertain to either that person, their name, um, or their child's name, or their family name, or their um, community name, or society name. Um, it was done in um, art rather than word, um, because our first language was um, um, Lakota, or our um, other was um, through art, was our language. Does anybody else have any any other questions about any of the processes or anything like that or any other information to add to the dialogue? Was there any traditional colors that were used by the Lakota? Yeah, and I have that written down too. If you look at older beadwork, a lot of the colors would have been either on a white background or a light blue background. And you can see that in like real old uh, beadwork. You know, nowadays it's um, infused with, with every kind of coloration, you know, but it would have been the beads that were accessible from that area that became pretty common for the colorations and things like that. So either the background would have been a uh, light white or a light blue. And then common colors that were used were like a light red, a light blue, a dark blue, a yellow or a tan, green, and then white, um, which are pretty common colors. And, and to an, I don't know this knowledge, I don't know if Jen does or, or you, you might know, some might know, or, or you can reach out to your community is a lot of those different colors would have been used for different components of the beadwork, whether it had been common that red was used for line work uh, and other like light or dark blue would use for filler colors. Even you would see common characteristics with what colors were used for what part of the actual design of an image. And I'm not sure which ones were what through like extensive, you know, talking to people or even research on your own, looking at old historical beadwork, you can kind of get an idea of like, oh, this was a common filler color, or this was all a common outline color, but those would have been your more common colors traditionally. Does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. I was just uh, specifically for ledger art too. I, I don't know if there was. Oh, yeah, for ledger art, I mean, it would have been the colors that, that you know, were available. So I don't think, or I don't know of any colors that were commonly used or commonly not used. I know, you know, the color black sometimes can be not used because, you know, like uh, within different cultures, colors have meanings too, you know, so like red or luta, uh, you know, it's like more of a sacred color and used for different components and, and different meaning, just like in you know, American culture in general, blue is considered boy and pink is considered girl or whatever. So, you know, some colors, depending on the tribe, would maybe be less hesitant to use on their artwork. But today, you commonly see majority of all colors because a lot of artists who, who have really, really went with, with this form of medium, you know, they'll get the big packs of colors and they'll really do intricate, intricate work. Good question. Does anybody else have any questions? Anybody familiar with ledger art at all? So this is, um, so you can show. Oh yeah. These are the traditional paints that I, these are traditional paints that, um, so these traditional paints, um, I was able to get a hold of um, um, we use them depending if it, someone wants to use them on the par flesh. Um, what else have we used them on par flesh? We haven't used them on paper. I think it's just used on par flesh that we've you, you, you know, probably use them on canvas too. I'm guessing. Yeah, I think so too. But um, yeah. So this is like the traditional paint in the family that I um asked to um purchase. Um, I don't know who the the 
the true, I mean, I don't know the whole process. I didn't see how it was done, but how I understood it was, um, is um, picking up plants, certain plants, especially um, the one that really comes to mind is the yellow was um, the, um, what do you call them? That are oh, dandelions. dandelions. Um, that brought in the yellow. So um, traditionally we did have color, but it's not this modern day color that we have. And for what I have right here, I did have red, but that was um, used up. So I have black, yellow, blue, green, white, and there was red. And what I understood from the lady that um, I bought from the family that does this, um, those were pretty much it for the colors. Um, just depend um, if you were able to, pink was kind of hard to do, I guess, but they were able to, um, long time ago, be able to get some um, pink, but it was kind of a really Trader. faint, really, yeah, really a faint color. Yeah, if you look at natural dyes or like ground up manganese that would be used for, for painting on hides and things like that. That typically it is very common for for most tribes, not even just Lakota or Dakota. They'd come from like two things: either rock, you know, your manganese that would produce a certain type of color, or also some kind of local plant that was used for the dyeing, depending on what it would be used for. So if you look at, you know, quill work, I don't know if Shana's on or not, but if you look at, you know, quill work and the dyes and the colors and things like that, that would have been similar process. I'm assuming to what would have been used for creating of pigments that would have been used on more traditional surfaces, stuff like that. If you want to get more into it, that's a, that's a whole art and knowledge in and of itself. But depending on what it would have been used on, um, you know, it could either have been used for dye or mixed with some water for pigment for paint. Um, and that would have been local, either rock or, or plant pigment. And, and, you know, a lot of natural brushes too from a lot of different tribes were either like horse hair or, or their own hair, things like that, that had been put onto um, the stick and things like that. If you look at like Hopi uh, pottery, you know, Southwestern pottery, even Mata Ortiz pottery in, in Central um, America in, in Mexico, you know, a lot of that was through that same kind of process of brushes found from local pigments that would have been used for the painting, either, you know, pottery in that example, or, or you know, could be used too for canvases. I always say, you know, it depends on how accurately you want to recreate your art, but don't think that you have to always, I mean, it's good to know where it comes from originally, but don't think that you can't use modern, modern things to create good art. Like when I do, when I do drums or when I do par flesh, you know, you can do this process and, and, but it's hard, like, you know, Jen said, to get your hands on someone who knows how to make that material. Mm -hmm. If you can know that, that'd be truly amazing. But even like India inks, things like that, that are inks, they'll, they'll go into a surface, like a hide, almost like a tattoo ink opposed to sitting on top of a surface. So if you're doing something with like a drum, you know, if you're making a, a chanchega and, and it's going to be something that's going to vibrate and, and get hit, an acrylic or even a watercolor will sit on the surface and it'll, I've never Chip had away. luck. Yeah, I've never had luck with that thing on, but India inks, things like that will work too. Um, but yeah. I, I have anybody, a question. Yeah. I noticed in um, the first time I've been exposed to ledger art was with like stuff by Red Hawk and kind of the early ledger art. And I noticed that their horses were really big. They'd signify the horses as being larger than the people. And I picked up some ledger art by a local artist in Pine Ridge, Evans Fleming. He does art, uh, ledger art, and he does very intricate stuff. So I'm wondering, was there a significance back then of making the horses so large as compared to what is today? I've never heard that, but I could be, that could be true and accurate. I've never heard that. I know, you know, Lakota culture is big horse culture. I mean, it's an important part of the culture still today. And historically, I mean, Shuka Waka, you know, Waka is in the word of, of horse, you know, sacred. Um, so that sounds right, you know, that they would put extra emphasis on the horse, just given the horse culture. But I don't know if necessarily that was the artist's intent when they were, when they were, um, creating the artwork. 
I don't know if you know Jen or not. Um, I was gonna say what I understood. Um, do you know Montalo, uh, Donald Donald Montalo from Pine Ridge? He does um ledger art as well. Um, so I was able to kind of visit with him because we were gonna um try to eventually have him come and teach classes, but with everything going on, we haven't been able to. So what I understood is, um, you know, ledger art back then was significant to what was taking place, um, time, place, and space, basically. And so if the emphasis was horse, maybe that was a time that, you know, um, you know, there was a big, you know, maybe the wild mustangs or you know maybe there was something going around around that time or maybe there was an event going on um you know how he explained it was basically you know when we do art or any ledger art especially because we're you know we're telling a story and the story will be, um, yes, like a winter count. Yes, mm -hmm. Amy. Um, so when we do ledger art, you know, the, um, the art is um, basically, you know, telling the story, the colors are signified to the story, you know, yellow might be pretty dominant. Maybe that's spring and, you know, you look at the picture and you're like, yeah, that, okay. You know, it, it correlates. So it's time, place and space when you do art or ledger art and that's how I understood it and now that you know looking at um ledger art you know people that are doing ledger art I can see now where they're at as far as you know it's like okay it's winter time you know it's a lot of white you know um fall time it's kind of a mm, not gloomy color but kind of a dark color you know in summertime, it's always so vibrant. There's orange and there's, you know, there's vibrant. So it is, it's like a winter count, but again, it's time, place, and space, depending what was going on or what kind of event or maybe um, a birth of, you know, a lot of young, young cults or something, you know? So yeah, it, it's. Um, yeah, do, do you, the, the artwork, is there any um, content involved in it? I, I, to know whether or not it was intentional, you know, you'd probably have to know what it's actually depicting, but still with that stylization, you know, the horses historically did look very large and still to this day, a lot of times when you see new artists that are making ledger art today, they still go off of a lot of like those same kind of design principles. So you'll see that being still replicated. Um, you know, but if the if it's an older historical piece and and there was a component that emphasized the horse, that could have been an indication that perhaps maybe the artist did enlarge the horse to put emphasis on it. But I don't know if that helps or not. It's hard to know without you know knowing more about the the piece that you're talking about. No, that that helps. I hate to ask another question. I feel like I'm I'm uh, no, taking too much time here, but. <laughs> Uh, I have another question. So Ed, uh, Evans Flamen pieces, he actually, please excuse my German shepherd in the background here. I don't know. He's going nuts, but he signs his artwork, his ledger art. Traditionally, do Lakota sign their art or has that, is that kind of a new thing? You'll see artists today sign their art. A lot of times historically, you know, before the, the written word, you know, you wouldn't see a name being signed on anything, but that doesn't mean that they didn't have signatures for things. So if we take this into another um, um, medium, right? Like look, look at Hidatsa or Mandan pottery um, from like three affiliated tribes, Fort Berthel Reservation in North Dakota. If you look at old historical pots, you know, a lot of those patterns that they would put either on the lips or the side of the pot would be an indication that at people at that time who knew enough about it could indicate that this was a pot made by such and such family. And that would be almost like a signature, I guess is how you conceptualize it today. And also almost like, would you call it like mental property rights or, or like, um, um, that's not the right word, but like ownership or property rights. So if I wanted to 
through that same pattern, I wouldn't be able to if I wasn't part of that family because they would have the rights to that design unless they actually taught you how to do it and then gave you permission for it. So there is indications like that where you'll see a signature type thing, but not in like a written form. It would have been through like a design pattern and that can vary depending on um, the medium that's used. So I know that exists in pottery. I've never heard of that existing in ledger art um, per se, but then also there's different design patterns that are common depending on the culture for different families. And that if, if the people around them know um, that design pattern, they might know like that's probably so-and-so's family or that's probably from this tribe versus that tribe. And that would be an indication kind of like how you, I think you would conceptualize a modern day signature. Does that make sense? Do you got more to add to that, Jen? I was gonna say, um, I'm just kind of browsing through like old time ledger art to right now. So modern, modern ledger art or signatures um i see they still kind to use must be his lakota name so it's the um yeah. he depicts of a little bit of a eagle i guess i'm going to try to see if i could share this where's the camera here okay so like his see the signature but if you look look to the far left his his name must be eagle or something with the eagle do you kind of see a faint of an eagle yeah see that so he's in implementing his lakota name and then he's also implementing his english name and then it was done in 21 which is this year but if you look at the old ledger art it's just their lakota name so like um if you go back to sitting bow his um his signature, if you ever f look at Sitting Bull's um, pictures and so forth, it's a sitting bull. It's a bull that's sitting. Yeah, like a symbol. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes symbols, you know, could have been used, but you'll see, which I think is really cool, like artists today, they'll kind of infuse that same kind of design principle within their name. Like um, if you've ever seen um, any of uh, Gilbert Kill's Pretty Enemy, any of his ledger art or his graphic design his name is so cool the way he embeds that on his work that it's like a little picture within itself uh, and you'll see that happening too anybody got any other questions or is that yeah thank you for answering that <laughs> so like sitting bull college um if you look at let's see here if you look at sitting bull college this is our logo and if you see right here that's sitting bull's signature we still use that i see that one too yeah i've ever noticed that see oh, okay. yep yeah, right yep yeah so like um i guess i've taken one of um um derek's class and i did the ledger art and my Probably ledger art was um, five years ago. Yeah, <laughs> a teepee, myself, and then I implemented my Lakota name, which is Tulance Woman, which is Wahuka Zenupawi. That was kind of like my signature because, you know, because that's who I am. But English, I didn't put anything English. Everything was pretty much um, Lakota. I think that's cool to think about for new artists, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand how much influence of thought we have today because of like Western culture in America, even when we create, you know, artwork, we tend to have in the back of our mind that it's going to be meant to be hung on a wall. And historically, that wouldn't have been necessarily the case, or even what kind of orientation you actually look at it. If you want to know more about that, which is truly fascinating, um, I forget what his first name is. His last name is Goodhouse, and he used to work for United Tribes. And he had Dakota. Tons, Dakota, yeah. yeah. And he has tons of examples of actual, you know, ledger art hung up the wrong way. And then also he goes through the actual process of how, you know, one figures out how it's actually supposed to be viewed. So even how we read and look at things, the orientation, um, 
is very much influenced by like modern day things. So I think it'd be really cool if, if you are an artist to think about creating some kind of even like symbol to represent your name or some kind of like combination of the two. Uh, Cause then you're kind of like decolonizing in a, in a sense like, or making it more historically accurate. And then you kind of create this own symbol that, that I think, um, you know, once you produce a lot of artwork, people know who that is. And, and that would be, I think, uh, really, really cool. Any other questions? So um, how does student, you know, I always take ideas from students too. You know, it's not just me. Um, the president of the college is my boss. So if she says, let's have this class, then we have that class. So one of the students are actually one of my coworkers, one of our coworkers, she's like, you know, um, wouldn't it be cool if we could do, it's the new trend. Remember um, you, you do artwork on um, board and you write something like welcome to my home or whatever. She said, why don't we do something for, you know, the language um, being able to say welcome um, to our home in Lakota. And I was like, huh. So I ran across Derek. And so this summer we're going to attempt it and see what happens. Yeah, um, if anybody's interested in that, you know, like if you see the, the welcome signs that people put on boards, you know, we're looking at like contemporary uses of like traditional art. So, you know, it's still usable, you know, in modern day life and society. And instead of, you know, welcome, Tayaya he, Tayaya hippie, or Tiwahe, or, uh, you know, Tiospae, or whatever the word would be, but instead have it, you know, in Lakota and have that board, you know, for, for Lakota, Dakota people in the area to uh, have outside of their house. And then we'll do the actual staining process. So it'll stain, you'll get that natural wood look. We'll create stencils or, or I'll have stencils ready of, you know, different, different, uh, you know, words that people would like, you know, like either welcome or, or you know, come again or, you know, doksha ke or whatever it may be. Um, you let Jen know, cause then I'll create a list and then I'll get stencils made for that. And then the, the last process is you stain it. So it seals and it really looks, you know, amazing just to kick around some other ideas for some things that some of you might be interested in, in partaking. And hopefully summer, you know, we can do that in person outside and still remain safe and, and you know, all that other good stuff. So as long as it's, been, as long as it's not live, laugh, love, right? Because yeah, yeah. we know a couple's going to get divorced if they have that in their house. Yeah. <laughs> and that ain't going to look good in Lakota either. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be, sound right to be like, who are you getting married to? Or <laughs> that'd be really long to be like across the entire <laughs> uh, And then if anybody's interested in um, getting any stencils, you know, if it's something that you'd want to make or, or learn more about or something like that. I'm gonna give these patterns and designs that I kind of went over with, you know, the, the meaning and definition and then common design patterns that you see here. There, there was floral design patterns too, Lakota Dakota. I don't know what those are. I know like Holly Young and probably Shana knows those, but for the common geometric design patterns, if anybody wants any of these, because they think they're gonna make something with it or even some of these other kind of common stencils that would have been you know, seen or used, I can send those to Jen or if she gives me your email, I can send you out some stuff if it's something that you think you're gonna do more of or, or wanna create as like for the SDSU students, like maybe part of your portfolio of a component that you learn. I'm a graduate of the School of Design too and Art Education. And I know at that time, there wasn't anything for like Native American art that was represented in the program. So regardless the opportunity, I think even if it's through Zoom, but to learn more about Lakota Dakota art, you know, it's very much appreciated. And I think it's definitely something that would be good to showcase, you know, what you've uh, learned and partaked in during your time, your time at, at college. So I appreciate it. And um, me and Derek are actually collaborating with South Dakota State University School of Design. And so we'll be doing a lot more work. Um, be doing a lot more um, work with um, South Dakota State University School of Design. And 
also the students will be coming out here and participating in some of our um, classes. And um, cool part of this, they are going to design my outdoor kitchen. So things are gonna change. Uh, we're gonna have some cool stuff that's gonna, you know, come about. And so, yeah, we're always looking for something innovative, different. Um, and also the kitchen is um, still gonna be a moving art. We're gonna still do art classes. We'll still do um, traditional foods and traditional medicines. Um, Derek will, um, I'm gonna have an outdoor kiln. So he's still gonna be able to do the pottery. And the cool part, um, I always try to brag, brag about Derek because <clears throat> not many people still do this um, is, um, Derek actually gets the clay from the Missouri River. So, um, you know, it's not like we order, we did, we have ordered, and I think we wasted more than we did by, um, so we ended up giving it to the school, but it's better, I, I think, and I find it more better that Derek just gets it from the river and teaches the whole process. And then people will appreciate, you know, I think understanding art and has, so that I've been doing these classes that I understand it more because there's a process and it, you, you appreciate your own art, but you appreciate other people's art. And so when we teach the process, I think that's when we have that um, connection. connection, you know, um, connection to the earth connection to the hand that does it, their, their thoughts and, you know, and every time we make anything, too is um having good prayers and good thoughts because you're going to gift this to someone so when you give something to someone make sure you have good thoughts and um good prayers with it um that's one of our traditional um yeah teachings if anybody's interested in um you know learning more about pottery and also how to do all the steps yourself um the way that, that I teach it is the same process that would have been used in this region, which would have been predominantly Mandan, Hidatsa, you know, tribal people from three affiliated tribes. Um, so we do that process. So you're gonna actually find the clay, dig it up. We're gonna do the process. You're gonna take rock from sweat that's pulverized to make your, your grog, which is gonna be your binder that gives it kind of the ability to shape the techniques that we use is paddle and bill. And then we also are going to do an outside firing. We have this scheduled for like a, I think a zoom. And then also hopefully we'll have one scheduled in person where you can do that whole entire process, start to finish. You can kind of learn about the pottery techniques, you know, from this area, from, from the Dakotas uh, traditionally. So that's usually a really awesome class and people, people have really enjoyed that in, in the, in the past. So there's definitely a lot of other stuff to look forward to. If, if, all you guys are interested in learning more, um, you know, look at Jen's Facebook. What, what is it for upcoming um, classes? Yeah. Um, if I don't have you as a friend, go to Sitting Bull Visitor Center Facebook page or um, Twitter, Sitting Bull Visitor Center, Instagram, Sitting Bull Visitor Center. Um, what else do I have? <laughs> I'm actually going to I, I got the okay to do TikTok, but I haven't even figured out what I'm going to do on TikTok. But um, I might have the instructors do the TikTok video because there's no way I'll do it. But um, yeah, just reach out to me on Facebook. If not, um, I think my email's been shared. Um, go ahead and email me. Um, but yeah, we're planning to do some pretty cool stuff. You know, it's still a process. Um, still a lot of, you know, um, working progress of, um, you know, I'm only one person here at the visitor center. So to coordinate and get this all done, it takes an act of God to get this done, <laughs> but we, we make do. Um, so yeah. And if you have questions, seriously, um, get a hold of me. I can get you in contact can with I any of the instructors. Before everybody bounces. The what? Can, can you turn the camera? I want to say bye to everybody okay. before everybody leaves too.
right. I, I hate to be nosy, but I'm wondering under his stencil book, what book that is there. Oh yeah. Shoot. I was going to share that with you guys. This is, um, you know, a, a pretty common book. I think we have it here at the college and you also can get it at the heritage center. And this has a ton of information on, uh, Quilling, beading, and also the design patterns, Lakota Dakota, I think primarily um, is the artwork in here. And I think it's a good beginner text if you don't have connections, you know, uh, where you can learn firsthand, you know, that's a good resource where you can kind of start studying it, uh, regardless of, of where you're at and where you live. Um, and I can share that information of this textbook too with Jen. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for that question. No, yeah, that's a good question. I meant to share that too. I just zoned it out. So, but appreciate everybody. Everybody's uh, hiding. On okay, there. here's here's the reveal. I need to see everybody's. It's attendance. Come on, FU students. <laughs> no hiding. Hey, can you send the um? Can you, you send everybody. the recording out? Because it kind of misses. Yep, we we'll have it recorded. Stuff. Yep, we'll have it recorded. Because I'm at work here. Okay. Um, we were all watching. Want to, okay, and if you guys want to go back for a reference, go to Sitting Bull College on YouTube and just scroll down. A lot of our classes have been recorded. And if you're interested in something else, there's a lot of other classes you can look at too. Yeah, and if you want any information on supplies or stencils and things like that, let Jen know. Or she can shoot me your email too, and I'll, I'll email it to you. So, Open Latonka for the class. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, uh, definitely keep in touch with Jen because there's tons of classes that she's offering. And it's pretty amazing what she does. So, there'll be more to come. So, definitely. Well, Any, thank you, everybody. Anybody else have questions? No? All right. Thank you guys. Right. Stay we'll warm, everybody. Next week. <laughs> next week is Tuesday. I believe it's the par flesh. That's the rawhide class with Tiffany. All right. Doksha. Okay, guys. Doksha. Thank you, everybody. That was a big move.